Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today for Give Me the Bible. And uh, we've been coming to your home now for about 35 years, and what a privilege it has been. And in that 35 years, believe it or not, actually hundreds have come to know Christ as Lord and have obeyed the gospel, and we're so thankful. That's what this program really is all about, is giving you the Bible. We don't really try to give you the opinions of men. We don't try to give you the doctrines of mankind, but rather the Word of God, the Bible. You see, the Bible is so important because it is the only book that really is inspired of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof and correction and even for instruction and in righteousness that we might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. So that's why we really need the Bible. But we're going to talk this morning about what you really need in life. We know the Bible is one of them, but we're going to call on Brother Joe Hancock right now to tell us, Joe, from your vantage point, what do you see that perhaps people need more than anything else? Well, Dan, based on your introduction, I think it's pretty well safe to say that, that people need God. He's, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's given us the scriptures. He's given us direction. He's given us countless blessings, and he's given us his mercy and grace extended freely to us. Uh, we need God. Now, a lot of people can say, well, I know God, and, and they know of God, but yet their lifestyle and, and their, their behavior demonstrates that they don't have that, that closeness with God because they live worldly are, 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 are like the rest of the world and not like Christians really should live. But, but folks, we need God. We're, you know the Ten Commandments. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the first portion of the Ten Commandments directed toward man's relationship with God, how man was to deal with God, how man was to worship and to, to sacrifice for and to glorify God in their lives. Uh, Exodus chapter 20, for instance, in verses 3 through 7, give us these, these ideas. You have no other gods before me. Uh, you shall not make for yourself a carved image to worship, an idol. Uh, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. And, and also the, the fact that you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so God calls on us to welcome him into our lives. Jesus in Matthew chapter 22, love the Lord your God. He repeated from the Old Testament scriptures, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and the first that's the first and greatest commandment. So the very first commandment we have is to love God, which means we have to accept God for who he is. It means we have to live for God, glorify him in the way we live our lives. Uh, you know, it, it amazes me that, that you consider the power. God spoke all the all the universe into existence he said let there be and it was now if god's word is that powerful what can it do for me in my life you know and it's amazing to me that that, that a god that powerful would even want to have a relationship with sinful mankind you know he knows who we are he, he, he created us he made us in his own image but then we fell off the wagon and we we got to, to, to sin in our lives and we, we don't know how to deal with that any other way but just do it the way the world does and continue to be sinful but God says, no, my way is far better because my way will lead you to heaven. Your way will lead you to hell. And he's pretty point blank about that in, in the scriptures. Uh, Dan, it, you know, God is spirit. John 4, 24, those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Some will tell you that the way we live our, our very lives are worship to God. Are we living our lives that, that we want to be pleasing to God? Are we living our lives for self? We talked about in a program not, not long ago that we have to die to self to live for Christ. And Dan, it's still that way today, and we need God and his word to help us do that. 
Well, Joe, as we uh, move along this morning, and we would be remiss if we didn't express appreciation to you this morning for uh, allowing us to hear those timely words that uh, reprove us and rebuke us and remind us that we really do need our God. Now, you know, we sing the old hymn, I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. Lord, the Greek word is kurios, means the one who oversees. And uh, we do need Jesus, don't we, Chris Grota? Absolutely, Dan. And, you know, let me tell you, you know, everybody knows John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But it continues in verse number 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The world is lost, period, and we need a Savior. We have Jesus. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, Luke 19 and verse number 10. We were lost in our sins. And he also came to give us a better life, John 10 and verse number 10. He says, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. John 14 and verse number 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So we understand that Jesus Christ has come for a purpose, but we need him. And I'll tell you, not only do we need to be saved from our sins, some people say, I got saved, or I'm, I want to be saved. And I always ask them, what are you saved from? Or what do you want to be saved from? A lot of people will just say, well, I just want a relationship with God. Some people know that they're lost in sin and need to be saved from their sins, but there's an even bigger deal there, and that is the consequence of sin. Romans 5 and verse number 9 says, much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. And that is to say, that without the blood of Jesus Christ to atone for our sins, we are going to stand before God, the judge of all the earth. And if we are not found with the Lamb's blood on us, we are going to experience an unfathomable wrath followed by an eternal separation from God. And that's because of sin. That is the price of sin. My friends, Please don't live your life outside of Christ. Don't, don't gamble with your soul. We plead with you today to obey the gospel. And if you don't know what to do or what that even means, please contact us and listen to the rest of the program. We yield our time back to our host, Brother Dan. Well, thank you so much, Chris. And, uh, you know, you've spoken well this morning when you talked about the fact that we really need Jesus. Now, we've talked about... Uh, uh, two of those in the triune Godhead, and uh, the Bible, uh, you know, mentions the fact that there are three that bear record in heaven. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. But do we really need the Holy Spirit? Do we really, Brother Barry Haynes? Well, to answer that question, let's look at the Holy Spirit and what we know about him. We see early on that Jesus promises in Luke chapter 14, verse 26, that that comforter, the Holy Spirit, will come upon the apostles his, to guide them into all truth. And we would see in Acts chapter 2 as he would come upon them and they would preach that first gospel sermon and they would begin to reveal the will of God to the world. And we see how he would work in the writers of the New Testament as he would inspire them uh, to write the things of God that they weren't just their words they were writing, but the very breath and life of God as the Holy Spirit inspired them to write. But you know, that promise of the Holy Spirit wasn't just for them, it was for us today. In Acts chapter 2, in verse 38, it tells us that those who are baptized into Christ after repenting of their sins will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And what does that gift do for us? What does the Spirit do for us? Well, if we turn in our Bibles to Romans, uh, we'll see several passages where Paul will emphasize what the Spirit works in our lives today. For example, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, he talks about it's through that spirit we realize the love of God. That's because as he speaks later in Romans chapter 8, verse 40, uh, chapter 8 and verse 5, 
that it says that the Spirit there will help us set our minds in the right places, that we have a mindset that's set on what the Spirit desires and not what the flesh desires. And having God's Spirit in us, it helps us to understand what we should and shouldn't do. And that Spirit will also intercede for us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 and 27. It says that Spirit helps us in our weakness and intercedes for us. When, when we don't know what to pray, it, we have one that can, can reveal what we can't even express to God. It's interesting as we read through these passages about the Holy Spirit that we see that the Spirit of, of all the places that God could dwell, if, of all the places where God could put His Spirit, you know, there's some beautiful places in this world. Uh, you go to the top of some mountains and look down. You go out to the ocean and look across it. And it's, they're, they're, they're immense beauty. But of all the places that God wants to dwell, it's in us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, he says, He sealed us and gave us His Spirit as a pledge. That spirit that lives in us. You know, when I was younger, my I'd go to my grandmother's house and she used to have a, outside in her garage, she had all these glass Coke bottles. And if we wanted a bottle of Coke, we would, we would get it, but we'd have to go back there and put the bottle back in it. And that was because she would take them back to the Coke plant and she would receive back the deposit. In other words, there was money that you would get because those things had a value to them. In essence, God's spirit in us is God showing us that instead of our lives being a throwaway, he gives us value because he has put his spirit in us. That's how we know, as Romans chapter 8, verse 9 tells us, that we are indeed in Christ if God's Spirit dwells in us. God's Spirit is that thing that we have that shows us that God is with us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. And, uh, you know, God is the creator of all things, and there is a natural beauty about God, and uh, certainly about His Son Jesus and about the Holy Spirit as well. Now, we want to go to Brother Jerry Munholland right now. And uh, Jerry, I know that a lot of people say, well, you know, I just believe the Bible is outdated. It's irrelevant to modern man. But uh, David said years ago, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not stand against thee. Is it not an inducement for us to live for God when we read the word itself? But Dan, it's a wonderful and marvelous thing that we have a God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, that said, as recorded in the book of Genesis, let us make man after uh, our likeness and after our image. And we are made in the image and likeness of the Godhead, the God. But it is more than this that he created us. But God communicates with us. And he's left us this written word for us. And so much so that as Paul records, he said, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. That God communicates to us. He's given us wisdom from above, wisdom from heaven, given to us. And so it's, communicates to us to mold us and shape us and to be the person that the, the best person that we could possibly be God communicates to us isn't that wonderful we can see the sunset and the stars and the mountains and the snow and and know there is a God but we don't know what to do to communicate with God through through nature we just know that God is but then God communicates to us we have his precious word, word of God, written for us to read, to hold, to, to dwell upon, to memorize, to share. Just some of the preciousness is given in Psalm 119 about the word of God, where David would write these words, wherewithal, verse 8, Psalm 119, shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to the word. So how is it that we live righteous lives? The Bible tells us. He said again in verse 11 of Psalm 119, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. What is it that keeps us from sin and the consequences of sin? It's just not that God said, Oh, I, I, you know, these, these things I'm going to list as sins just because uh, everybody likes doing them. No, they, these are terrible things that are sin. 
terrible thing that, that brings terrible consequences to our lives. Avoid them and shun them. Don't do these things. God's way is the best way. Don't sin. He tells us about sin and the consequences of sin. He, he, he tells us in verse 27, he said, Make me to understand the way of your precepts, so I may talk of your wondrous works. All the wonderful things that are written to us. Wondrous works. Read your Bibles. The precious word of God. We cannot live without it. Now back to you, Dad. Well, Jerry, thank you. You know, and in that word of God is something that is very important that we all need. Factually speaking, if it were not for this thing that we're going to be discussing here momentarily, uh, we wouldn't have any hope of life eternal at all. Uh, we certainly would not be going to heaven, but we would be lost, and we are lost, without this one thing that we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Brother Perry Cowan is going to address that subject right now. Well, with, with all of the things that have already been laid out by the previous speakers, we need God. We need Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit. We need the Word of God. And we especially need the Word of God because it reveals to us all of these other things. And it reveals to us the gospel. The Bible says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the writing of the Apostle Paul, he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God. It is the power of God, not a power, but it is the power of God, there is no other, to salvation for it to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, also to the Greek. It's by God's desire, by God's design, that the gospel is, contains the power of God. By his omnipotence, he could have put that power anywhere. I mean, he's God. He could have put the power of salvation anywhere in the world. He could have put it in faith only. He could have put it in monetary seeds. Send the seed and you'll receive uh, blessings. He could have put it in the sinner's prayer. But God didn't choose to do that. Not He revealed to us in the scripture that he put it in the gospel. And the gospel is identified for us, defined for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And to sum it up, it is the death the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us in 2 Thessalonians that he will come in flaming fire and take vengeance upon those that don't know God and those who don't obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then Paul tells us how that we obey the gospel. It's recorded for us in the book of Romans. First four verses of chapter 6. And he said, You, now that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death, therefore we're buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We must obey the gospel. Dan? And that's the great need that all of us experience in this life. And that's what this lesson is really all about, what we need. You know, sometimes people, is there anything that I can do for you? Is there, do you have any special need? I'm telling you, the special need is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ and these timely truths with those uh, that are outside of Christ. Now, we want to wrap the program up here today, and we're going to call on Buck or, uh, Rocky here, uh, Rocky Whiteley from uh, down at the Cabinet Street Church of Christ uh, in Bryan, Texas. And Rocky, why do we need the church? I know some people say, well, I don't need the church, but do we need it? Dan, absolutely, we need the church. We start out, for instance, in Acts chapter 2, this is the day of Pentecost with the beginning of the Lord's church, the Lord's kingdom. Peter has preached 
uh, to those Jews there on that day that God has made Jesus, whom they crucified, both Lord and Christ. And they recognized, these Jews recognized that they needed Jesus and asked Peter what they must do. Peter said, repent and be immersed, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And we read in verse 40, how that he encouraged them and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Those who gladly received his word were immersed and that day about 3,000 souls were added to their number. We go down to verse 47 and we can see what this number is. The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. Now, did you miss those words? The Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. What is it about this group of people? Well, when we look at the background of the Greek word ekklesia, we see it refers to the called out, called out of the world, called out to serve God, worship Him. But it's more than just the background of this particular word. It's what this word meant in New Testament times. It meant assembly, congregation, a people who meet together. And of course, what do they do together? They worship God. They encourage one another. And we begin to see the importance of the church in a few scriptures here. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. Acts 20 and verse 28, Paul says that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. And then Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 23 says that God made Christ to be head over the church, which is his body. And in chapter 5 and verse 23, he is the savior of the body. We start putting all these things together. We say that this group of people that assemble together in the name of Christ, they are absolutely essential. Jesus would not have built the church if it wasn't important. Jesus would not have purchased the church with his own blood if it wasn't important, not just important, but absolutely essential. And when we talk about him as our head, he is the savior of the body, we need the church. There's no getting around that. We are the family of God, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Let's live as the family of God. We need the church. Dan? Thank you very much, Rocky. We appreciate your closing remarks, and we do need the church. And without the church, uh, we lose our strength. Uh, we lose, really, the opportunity to grow. Uh, for the Bible teaches us that as a body of Christ, well, it's like you'd expect a, a physical body to grow and to develop, then the church must grow and develop as well. We thank you so much for watching our, our telecast today, and we hope and pray that uh, you'll join us the next time that we present Give Me the Bible right here on this same television affiliate. Our program goes around the United States now, and we're so delighted and thankful to be able to share that gospel that uh, Brother Perry was talking about a moment ago and uh, tell you about the church that our brother just uh, finished talking about. The church is the bride of Jesus Christ, and what an honor to be a part of the bride and to be ready when Christ comes for his bride, Ephesians chapter 5. If you're not a member of the Lord's church, let me tell you how you can become one. If you follow God's simple plan of redemption, God adds you to the church, Acts 2 and verse 47. The Bible says we believe with all of our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, based upon what Christ said in the book of John 8, 24. And if we're penitent, as he said in Luke 13, 3, and if we acknowledge him as Lord in Matthew 10, 32, to confess him before men, he'll confess us before the Father who is in heaven. And if we yield our bodies to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sin, and then live faithful to God all the days of your life, Revelation 2 and verse 10, then heaven can be our home. I want it to be mine, and I want it to be yours. Join us next week for another presentation of Give Me the Bible.
Sing the sweetest song of all. 